Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, Graham Mitchell, Chair of the External Reporting Board, and I'm, yeah, and it's with uh, great pleasure that on behalf of the External Reporting Board and its sub-board, the New Zealand Audit and Assurance Standards Board, that I welcome you to this inaugural Tony Dale Memorial Lecture. Now, given the significance of this event, uh, you'll appreciate that um, we held a similar lecture in Auckland yesterday, and again, we're holding this uh, lecture in Wellington this morning. Today, we have three very special guests joining us for the lecture. Tony's family, his wife Carol, son Joshua, and daughter Ashley, and we are thrilled that you're able to join us for this uh, special occasion to mark the extensive contribution that Tony made to the accounting profession in New Zealand and especially in his role in standard setting. Tony, as most of you will be aware, was the XRB's inaugural chief executive when it was established in 2011. He served in this role with distinction until his untimely passing in April er earlier this year. Tony was hugely admired and respected throughout the financial reporting constituency, both here in New Zealand and internationally. And much of what he has achieved, or well, much of what has been achieved here in New Zealand over the past four years with the new reporting framework is due to his vision and leadership. Now, when we were deciding upon an appropriate method of acknowledging Tony's contribution over many years, this lecture was seen as a most fitting tribute. Tony was an enthusiastic presenter, a visionary, considered thinker, and always keen to share his thoughts. A memorial lecture seemed an ideal way to honor Tony. And today, we are indeed most fortunate to have Professor Professor Arnold Schilder visiting us in New Zealand in his role as the chair of the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board. Arnold energetically embraced our invitation to deliver this inaugural Tony Dale Memorial Lecture when we approached him several months ago. He agreed to take time out of his hectic schedule of roundtable discussions and meetings with key stakeholders to share his unique perspective on the global auditing profession. Now, Arnold is accompanied on this visit by his deputy chair, Chuck Landis, Kathy Healy, the ISB technical director, and Meryn Kelso, Australia's representative on the IAWSB. And we also welcome Fiona Campbell, uh, a member of the IASB, Fiona is actually a Kiwi resident in Melbourne, and it's great to see you here too, Fiona. Welcome. We welcome them all to New Zealand. It's a crucial time for the auditing profession in New Zealand and indeed globally, as they begin implementing the new audit reporting standard, which is a key response to user demands. Also, there is immense attention on audit quality, which is not only crucial to auditors, but, uh, it, but also to the, all stakeholders in the financial reporting supply chain. Progress will be hard to achieve unless there's a concerted and integrated effort from all stakeholders in this regard. And this visit in New Zealand is therefore most timely, and we are fortunate to have the global leadership of the audit and assurance standard setting body here with us. Arnold has actually been a regular visitor to our shores, and many of you will know him well. His brief bio is, he became chairman of the IAASB in January 2009. He was nominated by and is a member and past president of the Dutch professional body. From 1998 to 2008, he was a member of the managing board of the Dutch Central Bank responsible in particular for banking regulation and supervision. He served as chair of the Baal Committee on Banking Supervision's Accounting Task Force 
from 1999 to 2006, and he was a member of the Public Interest Oversight Board from 2005 to 2008. He was with Price Waterhouse Coopers from 72 to 98, first in the SME practice, but from 1985 as an international audit partner. Arnold served as part-time professor of auditing at the universities of Amsterdam and Maastricht from 98 to 2009. His undergraduate degrees are in theology and accountancy, and he earned his PhD in business economics in 1994 with a thesis on auditor independence. So I'm sure you agree with me that Arnold is eminently and uniquely qualified to deliver this inaugural Tony Dale Memorial Lecture entitled The Future Relevancy of Audit. Arnold, we are looking forward to your address. Thank you. Yeah, you can see more of me than I can see of you because there are two very bright lights over there. Uh, but that's in the interest of the quality of the video that has been made of this event. So thank you very much for being with us, and of course, in particular, Carol and Ashley and Yoshi, Joshua. Um, it's for me as well a privilege to have been invited to give this inaugural Tony Dale Memorial Lecture today. And I've structured my remarks around three impressive quotes from Tony. And these quotes are taken from the speech that he gave to the prize winners of the School of Accounting and Commercial Law here at Victoria University in March 2015, a month before his sudden passing. And basically, Tony urges us in three different ways to do whatever we can to contribute to the future relevancy of audit. So this is the first quote. Think clearly and analytically. Tony explained to his young, talented audience that he had done honors at Victoria University. And that, he said, stretched his mind. It taught him to think. And that really impressed me because thinking is a key feature of standard setting. Standard setting is a vocation. It's not a commercial undertaking. It is why people like Tony are willing to give so much of their precious time to it, often on a volunteer basis. And standards can only be of high quality and capable of global acceptance if they result from clear thinking. But standard setting is not there for the fun of thinking itself. It's there to stimulate sound thinking by the profession. A few examples. Take the accounting standard from the IASB IFRS 9 as an example, which is about future credit losses. Well, how to handle credit losses that may be expected in the future. Or the so-called NOCLA project of the International Ethics Board. How to act as an accountant if you are confronted with an illegal act. Or our own standard ISO 540, which is on fair values and estimates. How to evaluate evidence dealing with complex judgments about future cash flows when assessing the valuation of goodwill. Now, you will have noticed the common link in these examples. They are all about judgments amidst of uncertainties about the future. You don't know the reality about the future until it has become a past. Credit losses still have to materialize. Illegal acts still have to be proven. Cash flow still have to come. But your professional challenge is to judge now. And that is your public interest mandate. As Tony said, 
to think clearly and analytically. Why? Well, on behalf of those who will be that future, the children and grandchildren around the globe. And that is, as I understand, why Tony had a passion for men mentoring many young people, scouts in particular. Just think of that interesting analogy. Are accountants, scouts, indeed, pathfinders, attracted by the uncertainty how and where to go? Yeah, my son has been a pathfinder scout for a while as well, but it was not a big success. <laughs> that brings me to a core feature of the IWSB standard setting, the clarified ISAs. They were just finished by my predecessor, John Gallus and his team, when I took over the chair in 2009. And New Zealand was a very early, maybe even the first, adopter of these revamped international auditing standards. But that's not a surprise if a Tony deal is around. So what was the key objective of this clarity exercise? Well, in one word, to stimulate a thinking audit. An audit that asks thorough questions, that challenges assumptions, that does not take anything for granted. And such thinking has been evidently missed in financial scandals like Enron, Worldcom, etc. in the beginning of this century. We are very pleased that now, and it says 110, but I have to say 111, jurisdictions around the globe have committed to using these standards. 111 because a few days ago we could add Portugal to the list. And you cannot read the details, but it says it's around the world. They are everywhere. What are then the key areas of complexity and related uncertainty that these enhanced ISAs address? To name a few, accounting estimates and fair values, group audits, risk assessment and evidence gathering, scalability for smaller audits, communications with those charged with governance, and above all, the application of professional judgment. And this illustrates an interesting aspect of uncertainty in accounting and auditing. It is uncertainty about what others are telling you. From the perspective of a user of financial statements, can I trust this information? Can I rely on this financial reporting? Or from an auditor's perspective, can I trust the underlying assumptions and judgments and evidence provided? And from an audit regulator's perspective, can I trust the veracity of the process and results? Are they robust enough, evident from what I observe? Indeed, in Tony's words, we have to stretch our mind to find appropriate answers. Should we do that in isolation? Each party by itself? Well, that's a rhetorical question. Obviously, you need others to help, to provide information, to question and challenge. And this is why the IWSB has emphasized the importance of interactions between the various stakeholders in our framework for audit quality. And I'm delighted about a very positive take-up of that framework for audit quality here in New Zealand. Of course, the auditor holds primary responsibility for achieving audit quality. But other stakeholders can contribute much by supporting a robust audit and also by engaging and challenging. So thinking in a standard setting context is not thinking in isolation. It's about engaging in critical dialogue with many around the world. We call that sorry for the jargon, due process in the public interest. Well, that sounds a bit dull. So let me quote Kevin Simpkins, sadly, another great man that we also recently have lost. Kevin said in his tribute at Tony's funeral, quote, Tony lived and breathed the public interest. He knew nothing else. He also cared deeply 
about people, unquote. Well, that says it all. Therefore, also in standard setting, we want to live a great duty of care to people. If not, there is no future relevancy. Well, I hope this has set the scene for an other quote from Tony, but uh, be prepared, uh, usually accountants do not use such strong words. So the quote is this one. In that instant, I knew exactly what I wanted to do, revolutionize the world of government. Wow, a revolution by an accountant. <laughs> and a successful one, yes. The New Zealand government was the first in the world to adopt the so-called accrual accounting, thereby changing the way in which politicians make fiscal and policy decisions, as Tony explained to his young audience. Just try to imagine this moment. There is this impressive guy. He's telling you to do nothing less than to revolutionize. And that, in the world of accounting. A bit later, Tony confessed, I quote, I still don't know how to do real accounting, but don't tell my board, unquote. <laughs> well, this is the moment that I have to speak about the revolution in auditor reporting. The IWASB has agreed in 2014 to new and revised auditor reporting standards. Effective, simply said, for 2016 audits. But it's fascinating that we see more and more early birds. In the United Kingdom, where the Financial Reporting Council introduced this already a few years ago, the Netherlands, stimulated by a strongly engaged finance minister and parliament, South Africa, where the national standard setter, Urba, needed to hurry up as auditors wanted to start as soon as possible. In Poland, where the law still has to come, but some auditors could not wait. And of course, more nearby in Australia. It's only a few years ago that IWASB member Marin Casal and I were grilled in public seminars. How ridiculous could we be with these plans? And now early birds there as well. And a recent visit to Tokyo and Moscow, where I was warned for skeptical audiences, this revolution was received with surprising warmth. Now, why is that? Why are auditors almost voluntarily agreeing to tell much more to shareholders than in the past, with the support of CFOs and audit committees? Because that is the new future, key audit matters. In the past, the only thing you would read from the auditor was the so-called audit opinion, a one-liner that tells you whether financial statements are okay or not. Important. Yes, said users to us, but users added one question with some urgency. Why don't auditors share more? They know so much through the audit. They talk with everybody in the company. But we, the owners and other stakeholders, we hear nothing ex except that valued opinion. Well, they had a point. So now they see much more. On average, five, six pages with key audit matters. And with those, auditors explain in their public reports what they saw as the most significant risks of material misstatements and how they address those in their audits. And fittingly, the new ISA 701 refers 26 times to the relevance for users. 26 times. There are more innovations in the auditor's report, but the rapidly increasing use of these key audit matters is enough to illustrate this step change in auditing, as immediate past IFAC president Warren Allen has coined it. And the effects in society are amazing. In the UK, investors have been giving awards for the most innovative and insightful auditor reports. And the International Audit Regulators Group, IFIAR, has said that audits become more observable for the public. 
Companies receive positive feedback from their shareholders and the auditors themselves. They are proud of showing the world what a great profession they have, how they have to tackle complex and at times sensitive issues. So I hear more and more the audit is stepping out of the black box. Auditors are back at the public forum where they belong. So the future relevancy of audit would one need more proof? I have one more quote of Tony. Yes, about that future. Tony concluded his speech sorry, to the young people as follows. Think big and make sure that whatever you do, you make a difference to the future of New Zealand and the world. Maybe Tony saw his audience thinking, hold on, we've just earned those awards, give us a break. <laughs> so he added one sentence, your awards today are testament to your ability to do so. There is no break. The future is waiting for your talents. Well, that's a great invitation to try even harder. So what is in our new work plan after the finalization of these clarified auditing standards, but also other new and revised standards, such as on review and compilation engagements, greenhouse gas financial statements, and of course, after the aforementioned auditor reporting standards. The IWASB has embarked on a new major project to enhance audit quality. And we hope that this again will make a difference to the future relevancy of audit. So we plan to issue in December a fairly comprehensive consultation, a so-called invitation to comment on ITC. And the purpose of this consultation is to explore how the IWASB might best address in the public interest the calls for enhanced quality in the areas of quality control, group audits, and professional skepticism. You see them over there. And this consultation is being undertaken at an early stage of the work on these topics. The IWASB has learned that early consultation facilitates more effective standard setting. And also at our upcoming December meeting, the IWASB will be asked to approve a project proposal to revise ISA 540, bullet number four, including considering the potential need for guidance for auditors in light of developments in financial reporting standards, such as IFRS 9. Well, that's in particular relevant to financial institutions, that's the FI over there. So why are we doing this? Just to think big? No, it is a response to many external developments. I have summarized them in these bullets. First, the business environment is changing. The way that businesses are structured continues to evolve and increase in complexity. Advances in technology are resulting in increased business integration. And entities are using shared service centers and big data. Integrated reporting and other emerging forms of external reporting are increasingly being used and financial reporting frameworks are also evolving. We have now much more management judgments as fair value accounting becomes more prevalent. And more forward-looking information is used as the basis for recognition, measurement, and disclosures. The second, audit firms' business models and the way in which audits are being conducted are changing. Because the changing business environment has affected how audits are carried out, in particular audits of multinational entities, which are often group audits. And audit firms of all sizes are also facing difficulties in attracting talent. They also recognize the enormous reputational importance of their audit practices. And as a result, audit firms see the need to tailor their approaches, and they are structuring themselves in varied ways. And this adds 
new levels of complexity to how audit responsibilities are executed in support of a quality audit. Also, members of the audit team may be located in different jurisdictions or time zones. So today's audits are being conducted more virtually using advanced technologies and new work methods. And number three, stakeholders have called on the IWSB to address practical challenges and inspection findings. We have strengthened the collaboration with the International Forum of Independent Audit Regulators, EFR, and its Standards Coordination Working Group, and also the International Organization of Securities Commissions, IOSCO. But we also have an ongoing dialogue with audit firms, national audit standard auditing standard setters like here, and others. And all of this keeps the board apprised of areas where improvements to the standards may be needed or where other actions to enhance auditor performance may be appropriate. Let me be a bit more specific. Audit firms have identified areas for improvement in the ISAS and IAS QC1, our quality control standard. And in some cases, audit firms had to develop internal methodologies and guidance to bridge perceived difficulties in applying the principle-based ISAs to various circumstances. And concerns also continue to be expressed by the small and medium practices community that more is needed to better support them in effectively applying the ISAs and ISQC1. Also, publicly reported inspection findings consistently highlight areas where quality audits are not being performed. And they emphasize the need for actions by auditors to improve audit quality. EFR's 2014 summary of inspection findings highlights persistent deficiencies in important aspects of audits, including with respect to audit firm systems of quality control, group audits, and professional skepticism. And also, and in addition, Regulators and audit oversight bodies continue to highlight concerns with how auditors are addressing fair values and accounting estimates, including the appropriate application of professional skepticism. And these stakeholders are calling for more robust requirements in the ISAs to address the auditors' considerations of accounting estimates, for example, how auditors obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence, and evaluate management's assumptions and consider indicators of management bias. So our project to revise ISO 540 will consider these and other issues. Plenty topics, therefore, to think big and to interact with many stakeholders. And I believe this interaction will in the end make the difference. I think we had an excellent example yesterday morning when there was a panel with people from many backgrounds as an example. That interaction indeed will make the difference. To stimulate feedback from both outsiders and insiders, we will issue that invitation to comment, that consultation document, the ITC, in two appearances. One, a front part, relatively short and with high level questions. And this may facilitate essential, essential dialogue with investors, directors, and others who may not feel it possible to weigh in on the many technical issues. But the other part, and you're warned, that will be extensive, in particular aiming at auditors, regulators, and national standard setters. But we already had a very good discussion over lunch yesterday with the boards here. But it's not only publishing this consultation and awaiting comment letters. We also have to engage in many exchanges and dialogues. In particular, I hope that we can have those with different stakeholders at the same time. So really, interactions. And of course, there can be obvious tensions. Some may want very detailed requirements. Others may prefer high-level ones. Some may prefer specific guidance, whereas others would say, well, keep it to the common principles. There may also be differences of opinion about what provides appropriate solutions 
to identified issues. However, there is a shared objective among all these stakeholders and the IAASB to improve audit quality. And our ITC will be a platform for dialogue on this in the context of specific initiatives. Nonetheless, investors and other end users of the audit must speak up about what matters to them. Practitioners have to be open to change and let us know what are the constraints and how solutions might overcome them. National standard setters and academia can contribute unique and valuable perspectives. And regulators can further share their insights and expectations and continue to contribute to audit quality through their inspection findings being maintained in a positive and constructive theme and working alongside preparers, auditors and other interested stakeholders toward continual improvement. For us, if we are really going to make a difference to the future of audit quality, we need those debates, we need to listen, to think hard and to carefully weigh the arguments. 2016 has to be the year of that dialogue. I have one more brief quote. Let's get on. I've quoted Tony's speech a lot, and the conclusion has to be one of action. The clarified ISRs and ISUC1 serve a fundamental role in underpinning audit quality and users' confidence in the audit and financial reporting. It is therefore in the public interest that these standards be as robust as possible and also be capable of being implemented consistently and on a global basis with appropriate guidance to support the principle-based requirements. And the IAASB believes that the ISAS and ISQC1 need to better address increasing complexity and new technologies in the business and audit environment and deliver against the public's heightened expectations of audit quality. The profile of tomorrow's auditor is and has to be that of a critical challenger supported by a regime focused on public interest and quality management and whose activities are better observable for stakeholders. So I invite all of you and around the globe to help us with big thinking and to make a difference to the future relevancy of audit and its many stakeholders. Tony concluded to his young audience who might have been overwhelmed by his perspectives with a simple advice for action. Thanks. Now let's get on with the awards. Indeed, let's get on. Thank you very much. We know there are, but it's always a bit difficult to ask the first question, but we have done that already. This was the first question, so <laughs> let's not lose time. Who is number one? <coughs> yeah, well, of course. Must yeah, you cannot conclude this speech with no questions, so uh, <laughs> we, we can't let you go. Yes, of course. Yeah, thanks. Change to be able to be 
The question is how auditors have to change to be able to deal with that future perspective. That's the, the summary, I think. Thanks. Um, well, <laughs> on one hand, I would say they are able to do so. So it's not, not that difficult. And you see that all around you. And we see it now also with this new audit reporting. But maybe it's simply that coming out of that black box, so not sitting somewhere there or so, but just coming back to this public forum and say, here we are. We are proud of what we have done, but we want to share that with you as an outside audience. And that's what we have not been used to, of course, for a long time. Our grandfathers, in a way, they started a profession like that. It has to come back, and it can come back as we see around the world. And if we listen to auditors that have already done this new audit reporting, you see auditors that are, are proud of their profession, say, well, look, I've been around all the world. I've inspected and audited my client with my colleagues, with the help of others. And now I'm here to tell you about what is most of essence in that. And I can do that. And auditors take pleasure in drafting themselves these key audit matters in a very readable way so that the non-technicians around the world can understand it. And they are improving over the years, as we see in the UK. Of course, it's not first time right. So maybe it's, it's just that. I think it's, is it on? <laughs> Your emphasis has been on the key audit matters and the engagement with multiple stakeholder communities. Can you imagine in this looking outward and communicating audit world that there would be more than one opinion for different types of stakeholders to support that conversation. So <coughs> there might be key audit matters for broad stakeholders. There might be something for governors. We already have a management report and an external opinion. Can you see further? Yeah, now it's really becoming difficult. Um, <laughs> let me first phrase carefully, there is only one audit opinion. That's the overall conclusion which we now have mandated to be at the beginning of the auditor's report rather than somewhere there. So you see immediately, well, this is the overall conclusion and usually and hopefully that will be what we call an unqualified opinion, which simply means okay. Um, but then, of course, if we translate the question a bit, you're asking, there can be many nuances for different audiences. And you're very right. And that's, of course, by definition, a handicap of just one report and also is a handicap that you have to draft it without the benefit of having a dialogue about your draft or so, which you can do with management and an audit committee, so they can help you, which is understandable, etc. So indeed, um, this is a difficult kind of selection process because it's one external report, so you cannot say, well, here's something for who, et cetera. Um, and indeed, we have emphasized it's the auditor's professional judgment to select the most important key audit matters. And you take that out of what you have communicated already with the audit committee and management, but that may be much more. And then you have to sit down and filter it down and say, but I can only do five, six pages or so, otherwise it becomes boring and too lengthy. The report. Yeah, no, yeah, but that's the whole point. If you have annual reports of 250, 300, 400, 500 pages, and now the, the auditor comes in and says, well, look, I'm helping you. Out of all of that, I have here five issues that are really important. I explain you why it's important. That's what we require. I tell you a bit how I addressed it, but high level, of course. And now the Im most important thing, after that, there is freedom for the auditors to do a bit more and maybe to pr provide some of the nuances that you are alluding to. And we've seen interesting examples of that around the world. Um, yeah, I cannot escape now from quoting the... the well-known Royal Royce report in the UK, um, because after the auditor had done that, here I have an important issue, let me say goodwill, um, and how he had addressed that in summary, he went on. 
Say, well, you have to understand that maybe in the past there was just one number for that valuation, one black and white number. But today's reality is far more complex. So management has to make a choice based on the number of assumptions about future cash, cash flows and others. These are the uncertainties that we were talking about in the beginning. And I have to make a choice how I choose those assumptions, how I assess them, and how in the end I, I evaluate the goodwill. But by definition, that is a kind of a range. You can end up here, you can end up there. So management will be somewhere on that range. Now this auditor said on some of those points, well, we found those valuations, and this is English, English, slightly optimistic. <laughs> or in another instance, mildly cautious, meaning extremely <laughs> conservative. But imagine, we were talking about your question, what needs to change? Well, this auditor was there, said, well, I dare to say that. And interestingly, the client was quite pleased with an orator being so brave to just make those comments. Now we have an <laughs> early example in South Africa, and there's a great video. I, I've forwarded it to you, Warren, so you can share it with everybody. Imagine the CFO of this company, Attack, with a CQ, and the orator, a, a tiny lady actually, fairly young, um, and they are sitting there together. And this lady, the auditor, has said in her audit report on one point, I find this fairly optimistic. Well, that's <laughs> a bit clearer than slightly. <laughs> fairly optimistic. I would never do it like that. That's basically what she's saying. But hold on. It's within the context of the unqualified opinion. So she says, well, it's okay. But if you would ask me, I might not have been there, but maybe a bit more there. And we have therefore seen reactions from investors in the United Kingdom. They are all on record in a report by the FRC. Say, well, that helps us. That helps us understanding that it's not black and white. That I need to understand myself how management has come to uh, these valuations. And therefore, we also require auditors, if they are making such a point, to refer back to disclosures in the financial statements, page so and so, note so and so. So well, there you can find more. And now just see what's happening. Management sees a draft of this order comment, including the fairly optimistic. Well, what will they do? Make very sure that their disclosures are up to the best they can. And the audit committee will, of course, check that. So you see a lot of more dynamics, interactions between the various uh, stakeholders. And that, we believe, it's, it's in the heart of this framework for audit quality. That will drive up the quality of auditing. So it's a great question and a great challenge that well, we believe, we see that audits can do this. Time for one more question. Yeah, I'm making your life easy by giving long answers, but... Uh. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm Nevis Bodica Redmain from Macy University, so one of the academics. I was just going to query, um, where do you see our focus should be in academia and in research? Our last 10 years have been focused overwhelmingly on effects of regulation on auditing, um, where do you see us going and how can we contribute to the future of audit with our research, please? Well, thanks for that great question. I will be this afternoon in Victoria University again and we can further discuss, but this question allows me to explain that all this audit reporting started with academia. Um, in 2006, the IAASB commissioned, together with the American Institute of uh, Auditing Standards Board, where Chuck Landers is from, um, we commissioned independent academic research. And we had four projects around the world, including this part of the world, basically with one question before we revise the audit reporting standards. Users, please tell the researchers what you think you would expect and hope for in the auditor's report. And the researchers came back to us in 2009 with a very clear message. One, this audit opinion, this overall conclusion is valued, but it's not much. So that's why the academics also reported to us, users want more. And I've explained that before, and that has brought us to the key audit matters. So just the illustration of the importance of academic research for our work. I could elaborate on research programs that we sponsor, etc. 
and academic conferences that we go to. But looking forward, I would say, well, I can name man many, but first of all, this audit reporting is now developing across the world. So for cross-border research, this is a fascinating topic, to see how it develops, to talk to the various people involved, why did you do it, how did you do it, how did it go, and then comparing various jurisdictions, cultures, differences between firms and practitioners, reactions from investors. So it's a wide topic, and, and we need that uh, because after a couple of years of experience, we'll do an implementation review. How is it going? And how can we even further enhance the standards? So we need that one. You saw professional skepticism on one of those, sli those slides. That's a topic that, that appeals to everybody. We had educational sessions in our board and our advisory group, and the conclusion was always, don't stop here. Can we have one more hour to discuss this? Because professional skepticism matters to everybody in this whole reporting chain, whether it's management or audit committees or auditors, etc. Again, that's great, but how do you do that? And how do you educate and train people to apply professional skepticism? What is it actually? It is, of course, in the standards you have to be skeptical, but <laughs> yeah, that's not the same as doing it. So in academia, well, what I did in the master at university a while ago, having really kind of round tables and giving students different roles. You are a shareholder, you are an investor, you are a critical NGO like Greenpeace or so, um, you are management, you are the auditor, and challenge each other and ask why and how, etc. And, and that's great. So both for research and for, for education, I would say skepticism is a very promising area. And then more generally, you have seen other topics as well. And, and each of those, we are right now in the exploratory stage. This, this ITC will be a very open document asking questions. How shall we take it from here before we go to standard setting? And I know research takes a while before you can arrive at conclusions. But I must say our cooperation with researchers, also through the so-called IAAR program, has seen a better dialogue. And, and researchers are very willing to see how can we be responsive, how can we up, can come up with maybe timely and preliminary responses, uh, uh, answers, responses. Um, so I hope this is an appropriate answer, but we are very receptive to ha having also the dialogue with, with, with researchers. So thank you. Well, thank you for that, Arnold. Thank you very much, Graham, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's indeed my uh, privilege to propose a vote of thanks uh, to Arnold. And I'm sure that you will all agree with me that Arnold was the ideal person to deliver this Tony Dale Memorial Lecture. Arnold, Tony would have loved it. He would have been very engaged in uh, what you had to say. So thank you very much. If I can just briefly try and summarise some of the challenges uh, that Arnold uh, left with us as a takeaway for all of us to think about and work on to ensure that audit is relevant in the future. The first thing that Arnold mentioned was that we needed to widen our thinking. We needed to think more widely and get away from some of the narrow thinking that perhaps has been around audit for far too long. The second point is Arnold said that we have to have the public interest right at the front of our mind. We need to continue to understand and appreciate that this activity is a public interest activity. We are there acting for the public. And the moment that we lose sight of that is the day that audit will cease to be relevant. Arnold talked about the new future, the key audit matters in auditor reporting. And he mentioned that relevancy to the user was mentioned 26 times in the standards. 
Now, Tony would have really related to that because one of the key principles that drove Tony and his work in standard setting was that the standards needed to be relevant to the users. So that is a challenge for us going forward. The next point that Arnold left with us is that we must change with the changing environment. And I paraphrase that as that we need to be more proactive. We've perhaps been too reactive in the past, but we need to work within this changing environment and be proactive to ensure that audit remains relevant. The next point was the interaction with the stakeholders. So we need to work with the key stakeholders, whether they're preparers, auditors, regulators, users, investors. We need to work as an integrated team. And we all need to have that same goal of improved audit quality. And we will get there if we work in that integrated uh, way. And finally, the slide that's still up there. Let's get on. And I've paraphrased that is that we need to work together to enhance and increase the relevancy for the future of this mainstay service area, auditing, which is such an important part of this great profession. And for us to make sure that audit is relevant in the future, we need to get on. So please join with me in thanking Arnold for his delivery of the Tony Dale Memorial Lecture. Can I now ask Arnold, Chuck and Kathy to come up onto the stage? I'd like to present them with a small token of our appreciation one for Arnold for uh, all of what he's done over the uh, last two days, uh, and also Chuck and Kathy for uh, gracing uh, us with their presence uh, here in New Zealand. Welcome to New Zealand. I hope this will not be the first and only visit. It will. Thank you Thank so you. much. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Just finally, uh, for those of you that prefer uh, to receive Arnold's slides in the paper format, uh, they are available at the table as you leave the room. Uh, those of you that would uh, prefer them electronically, they will be on uh, OWL, that's the XRB website, uh, next week, uh, together with the uh, video uh, of this wonderful lecture. Finally, can I thank all of you for coming uh, and being with us uh, and sharing uh, this uh, occasion uh, on a Friday morning, and a special thank you to Tony's family for uh, being here with us. It really was special to have you here. So thank you, enjoy the rest of the day, enjoy the weekend, thank you.